Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Lozada. I'm the nonfiction book critic at the Washington Post. Uh, the Post is a charter sponsor of the festival, and I hope will be for, uh, for a long time to come. It is my great pleasure to be here with these three authors, and let me just briefly introduce them. Um, Reina Grande is a fiction and nonfiction author. Her books include Across a Hundred Mountains, Dancing with Butterflies, the memoir The Distance Between Us, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Prize, and her new book A Dream Called Home is also a memoir. She received multiple awards for her work, including the Premio Atzlan Literary Award, the American Book Award. Uh, she was born in Guerrero in, in Mexico and came to United States as a child. Um, Alexander Cremont writes fiction, essays, criticism, memoir, as the author of multiple books, uh, Nowhere Man, The Lazarus Project, um, most recently um, a dual memoir called My Parents, An Introduction, slash This Does Not Belong to Me, with one of the most um, sort of innovative binding and cover designs I've seen in a while. Um, he's a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a MacArthur Fellowship, um, uh, was born in Sarajevo and came to the United States in 1992 when he was unable to return his plan due to the violence that had broken out um, at, at home. And Suketu Mehta is the author of Maximum City, Bombay Lost and Found, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2005. Um, he is an associate professor of journalism at NYU. His latest book uh, is called This Land is Our Land, An Immigrant's Manifesto. And uh, he came to the United States uh, from India when he was in his early teens, I, I believe. Um, so uh, it's always fun when you have uh, you know, a, a group of writers, you can just ha kind of have an extended conversation. Um, to, to start us off, um, I was hoping each of you could just briefly describe what, what led you to write this book, how you knew it was a story you wanted to tell or an argument you wanted to make, and also um, share with us a, a passage that you think um, exemplifies that, that effort. If, Reina, you want to kick us off? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. It's such an honor for me to be sharing the stage here with these wonderful authors, and thank you, Carlos. Um, so, A Dream Called Home is the sequel to my previous memoir, The Distance Between Us. And in The Distance Between Us, I write about my experience of growing up in Mexico without my parents, because they both immigrated to come here to look for work. And I try to write about what it's like to be a child in this situation of not having my parents, being left behind, and not knowing if we would ever be reunited again. And then I write about my own border crossing, coming here at nine years old, running across the border to be reunited with my family. So when I wrote A Dream Called Home, um, I wanted to continue writing about my experiences of growing up here in the United States, uh, as first as an undocumented immigrant, and then um, going on to become the first person in my family to go to university. And my father only went to the third grade and my mother only went to the sixth grade. So for me, going to university was one of the biggest accomplishments of my life. And I wanted to write about that experience of being a first-generation university student, um, especially coming from my own background of being you know, low-income, being an immigrant, first-gen. So one of the reasons that motivated me to write about this is because I feel that there are not a lot of books about Latinos in college. And I wanted to capture that, you know, that we do go to college. Uh, that, we, that we are working professionals. And to me, that was one of the most important things that I, that I was trying to capture in this book. I also write about my um, dream of wanting to be a professional writer and all the obstacles I had to overcome to make that dream a reality. But the book is called A Dream Called Home because the theme of the book is really about my search for a home and my search of trying to really find a place where I felt that I belonged. So I'm gonna read a, a, a brief passage that kind of explores that idea more. I didn't know that at 13 years old, I had turned to writing as a way to deal with my traumatic experiences before, during, and after migration. Because I was a child immigrant, 
my identity was split. I often felt like an outcast for not being completely Mexican, but not fully American either. The border was still inside of me. Physically, I had crossed it, but psychologically, I was still running across that no man's land. I was still caught back there, and so were my parents, because the truth was that we were never the same after we crossed the border. We all changed. Perhaps it was because we had left something of ourselves behind, the way migrants leave a shoe, an empty can of tuna, a plastic water bottle, a shirt. What we each left on the border was a piece of our soul, our heart, our spirit, clinging to the branches of a bush, flapping in the wind. Depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. These words were not part of my vocabulary, so I never used them to describe how I felt. I expressed my feelings through stories while my father drowned his in a can of beer. I turned to writing to save myself, to record and remember, to give meaning to my experiences. Writing was an act of survival. It wasn't until I was in college that I discovered it could be a possible career option. Having grown up never reading any Latina writers, I thought Latinas didn't write and publish books, so I had assumed I couldn't either. I hadn't thought I could pursue a career in writing until I met my English professor, Diana Sabas. If Sandra Cisneros can do it, you can do it. If Isabel Allende can do it, you can do it, she would say to me while handing me a copy of their latest book. Usually my stories were about Mexico. I had now lived in the US longer. Only through my writing could I hold on to my native country and keep it from floating into the mist of my memory. By writing about it, I could claim Mexico in a way I couldn't in real life. Despite everything I had gained by immigrating, I had also lost things. My relationship with my sweet maternal grandmother, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, my friends, and my native country itself. The Mexican way of life felt different now. My Spanish was broken, my Catholic religion almost non-existent. I knew little about Mexico, just pieces of its history, its customs, its geography. It was, in many ways, a mystery to me. Like my parents, my native country was full of flaws, and they had mistreated and abused me. And yet, I still loved and clung to Mexico with childish hope and optimism, dreaming of the day it would change for the better, in the same way I hoped my parents would change. On my first return visit to Mexico three years earlier, everyone treated me like a foreigner because I had been corrupted by being Americanized. To the people who had seen me grow up, I was no longer Mexican enough. But in the US, I wasn't American enough either. For years, I had struggled to fit in, to learn the language and culture, to find my way. But no matter how hard I tried, I still felt like a foreigner. So I took refuge in my writing. The words I put on the page created a bridge that connected both countries, both languages, both cultures. I hope someday to write my way into a place where I finally belong, where I finally felt I was enough. Thank you. Well, th thank you for having me here with these wonderful people, um, talking about something that has, has defined my life and the life of my family and just about everyone I know. I devised of this book, or these books rather, um, sometime in 2014 or so, when the images of migrants on boats were go trying to get to Europe were being broadcast. And one of the things that troubled me then, as it troubles me now, is the representation of immigrants and migrants and refugees as this faceless mass, just driven by some kind of obscure hunger that, and, and you know, the the discourse around it suggests that they want what we have, whoever we may be. And this kind of dehumanization of, of immigrants 
the erasure of their stories, individualities, and histories, and all that. That to me is appalling in a very basic moral level, but also from the point of view of, a, of my writerly life, um, it is something that I thought I might be able to do something about. And so I, uh, just as Donald Trump announced his candidacy and announced his racism in the same take, um, I decided to write three books, and then I um, added one more for some reason. And so <laughs> the two of those I, in, in, this, in this volume, one of them is about my parents. Um, and the, the overarching um, idea behind all these projects is um, giving, um, allowing people to have histories and stories, right? Or, or telling the stories and histories of people, people who are most familiar to me starting with the people who are most familiar to me, and those are my parents. Uh, my parents left Bosnia in the spring of 92. They left Sarajevo and then wandered around um, the region for a while with nothing, and they eventually emigrated to Canada, luckily to Canada, uh, where they have health care. Imagine that. Uh, um, and so Canada is kinder than this country to immigrants, I think, uh, but not entirely kind. What was always fascinating to me is that um, how they maintain coherence in their individuality and thinking and morals and ethics, my parents. And my assumption is always that all immigrants do this, that it's a complicated, traumatic thing to migrate from one place to another. Um, and what people carry over, and this is most amazing and interesting, is this uh, ethical system or philosophical system even. And so I wanted to write about that. I wanted to think through the thinking of my parents about the world and before and after and during their transition. So the book is not a memoir, strictly speaking. It's more like a series of essays about my parents. And this is from a part about catastrophe. My father likes to talk to people, ask them questions, tell them stories and hear theirs. Sometimes when I read or watch TV or just silently stare into space, he sits next to me and orders, talk. <laughs> True. <laughs> I bristle, but then I yield and, of course, end up talking. It's not just that he cannot stand silence, nor is it that he cannot bear the thought that people might have nothing to say to each other. It's also his voracious curiosity, undampened by his age. Everyone, he assumes, has some story to tell, not least his professionally storytelling son. My father expects other people to engage with the world, which, was, which has somehow delegated him to probe you and conduct a conversation. Silence is the death of storytelling and thus of love. In 2007, my wife Terry and I and our newborn daughter Ella went to visit her parents in Florida for Christmas and my parents came along from Canada. Terry and I had married in Paris earlier that year, which was when my parents had encountered hers and gotten splendidly along with them. Now, in Pensacola Beach, my parents spend time with Terry's extended family, which frequently gets together and features untold number of aunts, uncles, and cousins, including the friends of the family who have been over time absorbed into the kinship. My parents quickly saw that the essential structure and practices of an African-American family were much like those of our Bosnian one, and they liked that quite a bit. One thing was somewhat lacking, however. Terry's family didn't do as much of what my family always did, and does still. They didn't spend a lot of time telling stories. Their history, for whatever reason, was not entirely available by way of collective public narration. Thus, as we walked one balmy day along the splendid white sand beach toward Fort Pickens, where the great Geronimo had died in prison by the freedom-loving United States, as seabirds coasted over our heads below clouds, cares, and mirroring, my father said to my wife, Terry, tell me about your family. What bad happened? <laughs> Terry was gracious, but could not fully satisfy his curiosity. Apart from the general and everlasting calamity of American racism, applicable to an entire population, there were few particular historical and family disasters she could tell him about. My father found that, that perplexing, even a bit disappointing, for if nothing bad ha happened, it was hard to imagine how any stories could be forthcoming. If nothing bad happened, what do we have to talk about? If nothing bad happened, what was it that happened? <laughs> what is the story of nothing happening? 
Terry knew, of course, that my parents had failed to experience the siege of Sarajevo and ended up as refugees in Canada. She knew well that bad things had happened in the history of the Hemons, the baddest and the most recent one being the war in Bosnia. But my father's question was one of those moments when I felt compelled to explain my parents to my good wife, to establish and introduce the theoretical foundations of their thought system, to instruct her and anyone willing to submit and listen on the ways in which trauma alters the very structure of the world and reality. For I instantly understood why my father would ask a question like that. I recognized the compulsion. The what bad happened was a shorthand for catastrophe. He asked her to lead him into the history of her family by way of outlining the ruptures that defined it, for that's how he would tell the story of our family. The wars, the injuries, the displacements, the losses, the struggles, the moments of danger and despair. There could be no history without catastrophe. To outline a history, one had to narrate its disasters. To formulate one's position in the world, one had to define oneself in relation to the experienced catastrophes. And that which could not be narrated could not be comprehended. A family without a catastrophe could not be conceptualized because it was an impossible proposition. If catastrophe is the dramatic event that initiates the resolution of the plot, this is in the theory of tragedy, then its absence su suggests a possibility that the tragic plot will never be resolved. A catastrophe, in other words, might be a trap, but it also allows for narrative escape. If you were lucky enough to have survived the catastrophic plot twist, you get to tell the story. You must tell the story. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. And again, it's um, really wonderful to be on this panel with such excellent writers. Um, I wrote my book, This Land is Our Land, out of rage. Rage at the way in which immigrants today are depicted all over the world as robbers, as rapists, as murderers. I've been in this country for 42 years, and I've never heard immigrants depicted in such horrific terms by some of the most powerful people in the country. And this is true all over the world. I've been writing a book about New York for a long time, but on the first Tuesday of November 2016, I decided to write something else in response to the present emergency. You know, there's a lot of conversation about migration around the world because human migration caused by climate change is going to be the defining human phenomenon of the 21st century. Immigration might be the issue on which the next presidential election will be decided. It's the single most important issue for Americans in recent polls. So there's a lot of conversation about immigration, but what's left out is the immigrant's perspective. Why are they moving? What would cause someone to take their baby in their arms and cross the Mediterranean or go all the way across Central America, risk death and rape and assault, and try to make it over a fence, on the other side of which they're going to take your baby away from you? What would cause people to move? So what I say in my book is I'm connecting the dots. Through colonialism, war, inequality, and climate change, the rich countries have stolen the future of the poor countries. People are moving, not because they hate their homes or their families, but because the West, the rich countries, have left them no choice. So I'll read an excerpt from the beginning of my book, which uh, just gets into this matter. One day in the 1980s, my maternal grandfather was sitting in a park in suburban London. An elderly British man came up to him and wagged a finger in his face. Why are you here? The man demanded. Why are you in my country? Because we are the creditors, responded my grandfather, who was born in India, worked all his life in colonial Kenya, and was now retired in London. You took all our wealth, our diamonds. Now we have come here to collect. <laughs> we are here, my grandfather was saying, because you were there. 
These days, a great many people in the rich countries complain loudly about migration from the poor ones. But as the migrants see it, the game was rigged. First, the rich countries colonized us and stole our treasure and prevented us from building our industries. After plundering us for centuries, they left, having drawn up maps in ways that ensured permanent strife between our communities. Then they brought us to their countries as guest workers, as if they knew what the word guest meant in our cultures, but discouraged us from bringing our families. Having built up their economies with our raw materials and our labor, they asked us to go back and were surprised when we did not. They stole our minerals and corrupted our governments so that their corporations could continue stealing our resources. They fouled the air above us and the waters around us, making our farms barren, our oceans lifeless. And they were aghast when the poorest among us arrived at their borders, not to steal, but to work, to clean their shit and to fuck their men. Still they needed us. They needed us to fix their computers and heal their sick and teach their kids, so they took our best and brightest, those who had been educated at the greatest expense of the struggling states they came from, and seduced us again to work for them. Now again, they ask us not to come, desperate and starving, though they have rendered us, because the richest among them needed a scapegoat. This is how the game is rigged today. My family has moved all over the earth, from India to Kenya to England to the United States and back again, and is still moving. One of my grandfathers left rural Gujarat for Calcutta in the salad days of the 20th century. My other grandfather, living a half day's bullock cart ride away, left soon after for Nairobi. In Calcutta, my paternal grandfather joined his older brother in the jewelry business. In Nairobi, my maternal grandfather began his career at 16, sweeping the floors of his uncle's accounting office. Thus began my family's journey from the village to the city. It was, I now realize, less than 100 years ago. Mobility is survival. I am now among the quarter billion people living in a country other than the one they were born in. I'm one of the lucky ones in surveys Nearly three quarters of a billion people want to live in a country other than the one they were born in, and will do so as soon as they see a chance. Why do we move? Why do we keep moving? Thank you. These are books about to greater or lesser degrees, family. Uh, certainly in the case of Reina and Alexander, and there's, there's moments of, of sort of memoir that ab appear in, in yours as well, so we get to. What are some of the unique challenges you faced in writing about your own family, something so, so personal? And why does it seem that so many immigrant reflections end up being thinking about and questioning the choices your parents made? Yeah, that's a great question. When I set out to write my memoirs, I didn't want the story to be just about me. Because when we talk about immigration, immigration is not just about the individual immigrant, it's about the entire family. And what happens to one person in that family affects the entire family unit. So in my books, I wanted to capture that. You know, I, I wanted to capture the journey of my family across the border and everything that, that we uh, went through during our journey. So I was very aware of, of writing about my family, about our journey, and of course, the journey began because of the choices that my parents made. And I explore those choices a lot because through the years I have learned um, I have learned to see things differently than when I was a child. You know, when I was a child and my father came here when I was two years old, and then my mother came here when I was four, and I was left behind in Mexico, I didn't understand why they had left. I had no concept of, you know, the fact that we were living in the second poorest state in Mexico. I wasn't aware of the national debt crisis, of peso devaluations, of lack of jobs lack of opportunities. I didn't know about those things 
So I didn't understand why my parents had immigrated. And as a child, what I felt was that they had left because they didn't love me enough to stay with me or to take me with them. So it took me a long time to understand why they had made those choices. But I had to live with the consequences of those choices, and that meant that I was growing up without a father or a mother because they had to leave me in order to take care of me. So I, I didn't understand those things, and writing these memoirs really helped me to understand more about my parents and the situations that they found themselves in and why they made the choices that they made. Uh, for a long time, I was very resentful of my parents for leaving and for putting me through a childhood where I spent so many years being afraid of being forgotten, afraid of being abandoned, afraid of being replaced by US-born siblings. And I was so resentful of them for putting me through that situation. But then when I go back to Mexico to visit my relatives who still live in the same poverty that we escaped, I understand. I understand that even though to this day I'm still suffering from the trauma of separation, I knew that that was the only way that I could get to where I am today in life. That if we had stayed in Mexico, I would be living the life that my relatives are living there, still earning four or five dollars a day and trying to get by in a place that is full of corruption and oppression and very limited opportunities. So now I can look back and, and forgive my parents for putting me through what they put me through. And I forgive them because now I am able to provide for my children in a way my parents couldn't provide for me. And now, as a parent, I don't have to walk away from my kids just to go try to find a better life for them. I also don't have to put my, life, my kids' lives at risk the way that my father had to put my life at risk by crossing me um, across the U.S. border. I don't have to do that as a parent. And to me, I feel that that was one of the greatest gifts that my parents gave me was that now as a parent, I don't have to be in the situation that they were in. I think Reina is absolutely right when, when she says that, you know, that um, family is affected even by just one member of the family migrating, right? The, the whole structure of, of, of the community is altered, even in the best case scenario, when one part of that structure goes missing. I, I lived with my parents in, well into my 20s in a very small socialist apartment with my sister, right, up until the war. And then we broke up, I ended up in the United States, I ended up in Canada, my sister lives in, in London, England. And so what happens is this, you know, before the migration, or in our case, before the war and, the, you know, the subsequent uh, migration, uh, my, my parents were refugees. I don't really think of myself as a refugee, but my parents were refugees. There was a fracturing of that shared experience, right? My life was different in the United States. Their life was different in Canada. My sister's life is different in, in England. We did all right, relatively speaking, but that vastly overlapping experience of living together in the same language, in the same cultural context, with the same, as it were, um, social abilities, right? Um, we shared our experience. There was this unity of time and place and experience that we shared, and then it gets fractured, right? And it gets broken up. Even if we, were, had, if we had moved to the same place, there would have been a fracturing because I spoke English better, I was not a professional who lost his job to migrate, uh, I had not lost my social contacts, and so on. So what happens is this fracturing of a shared experience within the family. And one of the ways, again, to, to um, agree with Reina wholeheartedly is, um, to tell stories or write, sort of to build those bridges. Uh, there is something about building a bridging bridge between a new country and the old country, but also within this community, or within a family, there's a, there are multiple bridges trying to communicate this experience, right, and t try to unify the, the experience and to create a shared experience within the act of writing and literature and a book. So 
In other words, I live with my family in my books, but not in the real world. So the Trump administration is trying to eliminate or reduce family reunification as a criterion for uh, giving people uh, visas to enter the country. Even though I'm Indian, I didn't come here as a skilled immigrant. Uh, I came here be because of the family reunification category. My aunt sponsored my mother and her siblings and uh, her family. In the conversation, as I said about immigrants, is about you know, these people who are coming here and they lack certain moral value. This is the impression th that if you were to listen to Fox News, you'd get about immigrants. And if you actually wa want to see what family means to immigrants, you should do what I did, which is go to a place called Friendship Park on the U.S. California, on the U.S. Mexico border, which it's uh, just south of San Diego. So there's actually a wall which goes down a section of California and kind of ends right by the ocean but there's a small stretch of land which under the Nixon administration, the US government decided was the only place along the entire southern border where if your family was on the other side of the border, you could go and meet them face to face. And it used to be in earlier years that you could, if you, if you didn't have the papers to cross over or if you only, only had a work authorization and you couldn't go back and come back into the US, you could go to this friendship park and you know, have a picnic with your family. More recently, there's been a fence built across this little stretch of land. And the Border Patrol, which administered Friendship Park, have decided to make it all but impossible for people to meet their families. But still, it used to be until recently, you could go there on weekends and for 10 minutes, go up to the fence and put your face up to the fence and see your family. So I spent two weeks there last year, and it was the most heartbreaking reporting of my career. I saw families like Reynolds who had been torn because one member of the family decided to come over the border, almost always to work and to send money back. This is why I call immigrants in my book ordinary heroes. Almost all of them are here, and what little money they save up they send back to their families. So I stood at the fence with a notebook, and a Mexican man came up who hadn't seen his mother for 17 years. And he goes up to the fence, and his mother comes up on the other side. And they put up their faces. And he later told me, I could smell her. I could feel her breath on my face. He told her how much he loved her how much he missed her. She told him how much she loves him, misses him. She asks if he's eating right. Mm. And in the end, you know, they can't touch because there's this thick, ugly iron fence. They can't hug each other. But the holes in the fence are only large enough to put your pinky through. So he puts his pinky through, and his mom puts her pinky through, and they touch pinkies. That's all they're allowed. It's called the pinky kiss. All along the fence, mothers and children, best friends, siblings, touching, this kissing of the pinkies. If you've ever had a rupture with someone in your family, go down to Friendship Park and see what happens when there's a state which keeps you from your family, when there are laws that are made by bureaucrats and lawyers sitting in distant offices which keep you from your family. See how much family means to these migrants. See what they're doing for the migrants. It was the most heartbreaking but also the most hopeful reporting of my career because I saw what family really means to immigrants. It's it's the expression of the heart through the touching of the pinkies.
Alexander, you write that um, our history is the uh, unassuageable longing for the home that could never be had. Uh, is that an inevitable part of migration, this, this, this longing, this almost these parallel lives that you're running through in your head, wondering what things would have been like in a different circumstance if different decisions had been made? Well, I think, I mean, um, I busy myself with defining what home is in my books for myself and whoever else cares about that. Um, but what happens with migration, and I think, you know, there's a difference between immigrants and refugees, but it's a difference in degree, but not in kind. I think migration is always traumatic to some extent. And so if you're a refugee escaping war, that's much larger trauma, or not much larger, but different trauma necessarily, than someone who just gets up and walks, uh, not just someone who gets up and walks across the border. There's a difference, they're, they're, they're important difference. let alone someone like me who flew in and decided to stay. Nevertheless, it divides the life, migration, that act of getting from one place to another, divides the life into the before and af the after, right? And Rain also mentioned that. So your, your life and life of your family and life of all your friends might be is divided between the before and the after. The unity of time is broken and also the unity of space. The way we lived before the war in Sarajevo, everyone was in the same space all the time. There's, we have an entirely different notion of privacy. My father, to this day, if I'm working on the computer, he just leans over my shoulder <laughs> <laughs> and reads the, the emails without any compunction whatsoever because we all were in the same space. And so I think that um, what makes home fully um, impossible in that it's, is this rupture, right? This tra traumatic rupture the dividing of the life into the before and the after, into the here and there, right? And so to the struggle is, and this is not necessarily um, entirely traumatic. That is, trauma doesn't have to be devastating and, and entirely destructive. There are ways, I hope, to use this productively, one of which is, is, is writing in my mind, and trying to find a, a new kind of unity, to create new homes, or to have two homes even. I, when I go to Sarajevo, I say I go home. But then I go from Sarajevo back home to Princeton now and before Chicago. So you can have more, home, more homes than one. But somehow, it, that unity that I remember experiencing, right, that, that um, solidity, that um, total presence of homeness in the world is no longer available. Um, I have no desire to own property and could live out of a suitcase. Uh, this is how I feel, not because I'm a cosmopolitan person, but because oh, this might all be gone sooner or later, just like my you know, early home went away, it's no longer available. So the, the possibility of the home not being available is forever present to all of us. For years I've always been jealous of people who had a hometown, the place that to them meant home. Um, we moved around a lot as well, from. Peru to California and different, different parts of the United States. And um, I felt that they had something I couldn't have. Um, Blaine, now you touch on this in your book as well. You describe a conversation with, with Betty, with your younger sister, in which she asks, do you think th things would have been different if they'd never left, right? Uh, do you think we would all be together as, as a family? There's a sort of longing there as well for something that's lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was younger, I used to have these conversations a lot with my siblings about what our life might have been like if we had stayed in Mexico, if my parents hadn't immigrated, if they hadn't broken up once they got here, and um, just thinking about the family that we used to be as opposed to the family that we are now. But now when I go back to Mexico, I have a different perspective on that because when I go back, you know, I, I have um, uncles and aunts that, that stayed there. And I remember my mother, whenever she went back to Mexico, she was trying to get her brother to come out here because, um, you know, her brother, like the rest of the family, was very poor. He was living in a one-room shack with his seven children and he could barely afford to feed them. And my mother would say, why don't you go to the US so that you could make money to support your family? And my uncle would always say, I would rather be poor but together. And he refused to leave. 
But when I go to Mexico and I look at my cousins who didn't finish elementary school because my uncle pulled them out as soon as they were old enough and they had to start working to help him put food on the table, I think about the, the consequence of, of, of his choice versus my, my parents' choice of immigrating and trying to find more opportunities for us. So I don't have these nostalgic, um, you know, uh, memories of, of my childhood or I don't fantasize about what my life might have been like because I see it. I see it when I go, it's in my face, that, that poverty, it's in my face and I remember and I know that that's what my life would have been like. And I had this really interesting experience because um, I was recently published in Mexico for the first time. I've been published here in the US for 13 years, but in Mexico, I just got published there two years ago for the first time. And I went to Mexico to do some events, um, coming back to my native country as a published author. And I was doing events with these Mexican writers from Mexico. And most Mexican writers from Mexico are from the upper class. And I was sitting there with them and I was thinking, if I hadn't immigrated, I would be their maid right now instead of sharing the stage with them. And that was when I felt grateful for what my parents did for me and for what we went through. It, it soothes that pain that I still carry with me when I am faced with uh, the reality of where I am now and where I could have ended up if things had been different. So, Ketel, your book is explicitly called a, a manifesto, and you say early on that it was written in sorrow and rage and hope. I think in what you've shared so far this afternoon, we've gotten a sense of the rage and of the sorrow. Um, <laughs> where is the hope? How did these three emotions come together in your book? Hope is the thing with feathers. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you look around the world, the conversation around immigration, I see why right, it's difficult to, you know, be hopeful. The fear of migrants is doing incalculably more damage to countries than the migrants themselves ever could. I mean, Exhibit A is Brexit, the biggest own goal in British history. <laughs> um, but you know, there is, and this is, this is where the hope comes in. So. As I said, the rich countries have stolen the future of the poor countries through colonialism, war, inequality, climate change. People are moving like never before because they have no option. They have to move. They'll literally roast to death or drown in the country if they're living in. Um, but when people move, this is the happy ending of my story. It's a good news story. Greater migration helps everyone. It helps the countries that the migrants move to, particularly the rich countries, because the rich countries aren't making enough babies. The United States would collapse if people were to stop immigrating here. The reason that America does well is that we've always been good at importing the talent that we've needed, both skilled and unskilled. And if you really want to look at hope, I mean, I'm a New Yorker, Two out of three New Yorkers are immigrants or their children. And New York has never been more prosperous, more dynamic, safer. Immigration works, and we can see it in the great cities of our world. London, New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. I was walking around uh, D.C. today and yesterday, and everywhere, I mean, I've never had such a great choice of restaurants to eat at. I can have pupusas or parathas, I can. Um, so when people move, it's, you know, it's not just that it's you know, nice choice of food or music, economically it makes sense. The Social Security Fund uh, this year will actually give out more in benefits than it takes in, in revenue. 
In about 15 years, if you retire in 15 years, you'll only get 80 cents on the dollar of what you're entitled to. And the only thing that can save the social security fund is immigration. The rich countries simply aren't making enough babies. Immigrants, when they move, they're younger. Um, they enter the workforce in greater numbers than the native born. The immigrant armada that is coming to our shores is actually a rescue fleet. And it's also good, certainly for the migrants, because um, in the case of refugees, it's literally a matter of life and death. Um, for people who migrate for economic reasons, they greatly improve the standard of living. An Indian programmer who moved to Silicon Valley will increase his, standard, his, his income by around fivefold. And it's also great for the countries that they move from because if you really want to help the poorest people in the world, then let people from those countries move here and send money back in remittances. Remittances are the best and the most targeted way of helping the global poor. Those $100 and $200 money orders that migrants send, they go directly to their families to help a brother with an education, a mother with a hospital bill, to build a school, to build a home. And it's not siphoned off by corrupt governments. So remittances last year amounted to $700 billion, which uh, is four times more than all the foreign aid given to the poor countries in the world. So immigration is a good news story, and this is how we need to think uh, of people who are moving. Human migration is a good thing. We've always moved and will continue uh, moving, and we ought to take it as our birthright. The last question I'll ask before we, we open it up to questions from the audience. Um, with, with immigration, with, with the movement of people being such a defining political issue of this time, uh, certainly in the United States, but around the world, uh, does that create any special urgency, responsibility, burden in telling immigrant stories? today for you as, as writers? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think urgency, but I also like that word, the uh, burden, because that is, um, I feel that as an immigrant writer, I feel this big responsibility to speak up for my community. And sometimes I feel that, you know, why can't I just be a writer? You know, why do I always have to be the immigrant writer, right? And that has created some challenges in me, like the way I see myself as a writer, how do I fit in to American literature? Do I fit in to American literature? And then I remind myself that the immigrant story is the American story. So yes, I do fit into American literature. And I feel that I have been given a gift and I need to make sure that I use this gift that I have for language and the opportunity that I had to be published to use that to speak up for my community and to raise my voice for those whose voices have gone unheard and I take that responsibility very seriously. I also feel that here in this country, you know, we tend to judge immigrants by what one immigrant does, the whole community gets judged by it, usually in a negative way, right? If one immigrant does something bad, then all the whole immigrant community pays for that, what that one person did. And I would like to reverse that, you know, why can we judge all the good things that immigrants do, you know, um, individually, what we do, what we bring here, our skills and our talents, why can't you look at one immigrant who's doing well and say, wow, you know, our immigrant community is doing this, this is what they bring here, let's celebrate 
their contribution. So that's what I would like to see more of, um, that if we are gonna represent our community when we do something bad, let's also represent our community when we do something really wonderful. One, one of the projects I started working on um, after 2014, 2015, is uh, interviewing Bosnians who were um, migrated to various places in the world. And the basic question is, how did you get here? Wherever here is, it could be DC or St. Louis or Tokyo, Japan, um, or Australia. And one of the persons I interviewed, she sells high-end real estate in South Florida now, but she was uh, under, as a teenager, she survived the siege of Sarajevo, ended up in a college in Iowa. Long story short, she was giving a presentation to the Trump family um, one day after attaining um, a business degree. And uh, in, among the Trumps was the Donald too. And so after her presentation, he came up to her and she is um, good looking. And so he came up to her and, and asked, he said, what's your story start from the end? <laughs> And to me, that is symptomatic of Trumpism, but also this model of, um, how would I put it, representation of immigrant experience, where all that matters is what you are here now, right? No history, no story, no past, no other place, no other time, right? And so, and of course, in Trump's case, it's the ultimate pathology of everything, including that. And so to me, as a writer, there is, Everything that Reina says, I agree with again, um, because there is this situation which I willy-nilly, I did not you know, try to do this, but I speak for some people um, who have similar experience, the Bosnians at least. But I also feel a need to cover the whole range of the experience, not only this where we are at right now, which is very narratively rich as it is, but how we got here. Right, whoever we may be. To me, it's also a narrative opportunity. There are a lot of books that can come out of that because each journey is a story. Each you know, migration is a whole world of stories. Um, narration is migration squared, if you wish. And so that it, it is the wealth. If you take out immigrant writers from American literature, you will be stuck <laughs> with suburban affairs for the rest of your life. <laughs> They'll be just sitting by the pool and drinking cocktails. <laughs> so I think there's a, there's a battle of storytelling all around the world. If you look at all these populists, as they're called, Trump, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage in the UK, Modi, in my birthplace, India, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Putin in Russia, Orban in Hungary, all these strong men, populists. They're gifted storytellers. That's what a populist is. A populist can tell a false story well. And the only way to fight him is by telling a true story better. So, you know, as a writer, as a journalist, I like fact-checking. <laughs> Not everyone in Washington, D.C. likes fact-checking. I hired a professional fact-checker to go through my book and have 50 pages of end notes. The thing is that, you know, we need to tell these stories which are backed up by numbers and have a strong argument. And often people who are trying to tell immigrant stories, particularly in academia, you know, they've got the right numbers, but they don't have the passion. Or they equivocate. You know, we on the left like to be nuanced. We like to say, on the one side this, on the other side that. You know, some issues there isn't an other side. Cannibalism, for instance. <laughs> On the one hand, some people say eating your fellow man is wrong. On the other hand, it's a cheap and readily available source of protein. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the marketplace of ideas and flesh. <laughs> so the immigration story has got to be told 
with passion and, uh, and, and backed up with facts and with numbers. But, you know, it, this is why people like Trump and Modi and Putin are so afraid of journalists and writers. This is why writers, journalists, authors are getting persecuted, shot, imprisoned, audited all over the world. We are the ones who the, the truth tellers. And, and I take in my motto, the great Yaroslav Seifert, the Czech poet who won the Nobel Prize, he once said, for anyone else, not telling the truth can be a tactical maneuver. Um, he can just stay silent when there's a moral crisis or an emergency. But a writer who's not telling the truth, even if he's just staying silent, is lying. We have two mics here, if anyone has uh, questions for any of our authors. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been talking about immigration, that the current administration is uh, against immigration. But aren't we missing the point? If uh, I think I've heard that, that if, if an immigrant is coming from Norway, he's most welcome but somebody coming from the asshole countries is not. So isn't this really a discussion about racism and not immigration? Well, I don't think those are mutually exclusive. I mean, we know what anti-immigration is. I don't think that, I mean, it's kind of, you know, killing two flies with, with one hand. It's controlling, um, it's, uh, and enabling, or in, how would I put it, enabling the endurance of white supremacy on the one hand, mm -hmm. um, but also controlling, um, I really cannot differentiate between those two. It is absolutely racist because people of color and people, poor people migrate. But people from Norway do not come here because Norway has healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have free healthcare. Who, who would come here from Norway? <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's Trumpian nonsense, but poor people and people of color migrate more, far more likely than Norwegians or Scandinavians. And so, yes, I mean, those are two things that are really two different names, anti-immigrant and racist. That's really the same thing. So you're basically you're saying it's, it's, it's the same thing. Right. But from the American, point, the, the, the American point of view, you know the 1924 Act, I'm not an expert on that, I mean, I'm just speaking generally. The quota system that was here, the, I think it's the Heller Act of 1924, after the 1920s, was uh, uh, giving a quota to the North European countries. Not even the Southern European countries were allowed in that system. Mm -hmm. And then later on, of course, it took about 30, 40 years. In the 1960s, you had a reversal of the quota system and, you know, when, the, uh, when uh, other immigration laws were passed, the 1965 allowed this unification of family and from the third world countries. So what I'm saying is that it's basically targeting, uh, it's kind of racist more than anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. So that was my point. Yeah, and that's a great point. And I think also, uh, it's not just racism, but also classism, because we discriminate poor right. immigrants. Right. And we have seen that, you know, through our, the history of this country, how we have discriminated immigrants because of class. And just one a quick example is the Irish. You know, the Irish were discriminated because exactly. they were the poor, Catholic, drunk Irish. And now look, the Irish have become white. Right. And now they are, in mainstream America, whereas before they were not wanted here. So it's, it's classism, racism, also religion, religion plays a big part in which immigrants we want and which ones we don't. That's a good point. To, to add to Rena's point, in the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin started railing against this group of people who were coming into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He said, these people, they don't speak our language, they don't follow our customs, they're lazy, they've, we shouldn't let them into Pennsylvania. He was, 
He was talking about, quote, those Palatine Boers. He meant Germans, the ancestors of our current president. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, your panel. My name is Nora Morales, and I've brought 11 immigrant students. Please stand up from my identity. And they came all the way from Gaithersburg, Maryland, to meet Reina Grande because we read her book, A Distance Between Us. But we would like you to please give them some advice. They're about to enter middle school and they are all immigrants and have an immigrant story. So what advice do you have for a rising middle schooler? Yeah, good luck with middle school. <laughs> <laughs> you will survive. <laughs> but most importantly, I don't want you to be in survival mode. I want you to learn how to thrive. And that goes for the rest of your life, that no matter what obstacles come your way, don't just survive, but thrive and rise above it all. And most of all, for, don't forget where you come from, because where you come from is something to be celebrated. So don't ever be ashamed of where you first started. Uh, Buena uh, suerte. Along those lines, stay bilingual and get trilingual and quadrilingual. Get as many languages as possible. And read, read, read. Well, I'm not an immigrant, though my husband is. Um, but something that you all mentioned spoke to me and caused me to wonder about your relation with your audiences who are non-immigrants, and that's the concept of home. I grew up on a small farm in Maryland, um, and though my siblings and I all moved away, it was always our anchor. And whenever I thought about home, I thought about that beautiful little farm in Maryland. But my parents had to sell it eventually, and I felt like part of my sense of home was gone forever. And so that's how I connect in some way with your stories. And so I wonder, if you consider that, or when you are relating to people who are, are not immigrants, the fact that everybody, most people at some point lose their home or some part of their home, and how you can connect your stories with people like me who have not immigrants but have lost a certain sense of their home. Uh. Well, I think, first of all, we really need to remember that we are all human beings. So if we can start from that place. We have so many things in common. And it's so important to start there because it's easy to get lost in what makes us different. But let's celebrate instead what connects us. And I would like to say that, you know, for me, being called like, you know, this is an immigrant memoir, and I feel like it's just a memoir. You know, this is a story of the human experience, right? So, so that's how we connect. And, and I think ultimately, you know, we're all in this fight together. We're all in this country together, and it's all of our responsibility to make sure that nobody feels that they don't belong here. I'm afraid we're being told that we need to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Reina, Alexander, Zuketu, for uh, your work and for your insights today. <laughs>